joining us today. We're so glad you're here this morning as we worship our Lord and Savior. Now, the text I'm going to be speaking out of today, um, you're going to go, wait a minute, shouldn't you be preaching that when Easter comes? Yeah, but we can talk about it a little sooner than that as well. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask you to open them up to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 28 is where we're going to be. If not, it'll be up on the screen for you. Matthew 28, 1 through 6 goes like this. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, or other Mary, be known as the other Mary, but anyway, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Probably not going to guess the three words that I pulled out of this text this morning to teach from, but the, the, the three words I pulled out actually comes at the end in the back of verse 2. Verse 2 says, There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone. Now watch these three words, because they're pivotal in what we're going to be talking about today. And he set on it. Set on it. So if I'm writing this story, and I'm picturing it in my head, am I the only crazy one that whenever I read something, I picture it in my head? So I have this whole picture in my head. And when I see this picture in my head, I, I, I see this majestic angel, this beautiful angel lit up, white as snow, powerful, all of that. I, I, I see him standing there in, in, in power, almost, almost, and just, ugh. You know what I'm talking about? You picture that, right? You picture the strength and the power of this angel in the story. You picture that, and you see that, and, and, but, but what is described here is, yes, it's the angel's majestic. Yes, his clothes were white as snow. His appearance was like lightning. He was all those things, but he does something that almost seems contradictory to what I would see him doing. It says he's setting on top of the stone. He's setting. I would argue perhaps the angel is preaching one of the most powerful sermons ever ever given. I would suggest that by the angel simply setting on top of the stone. How many moms do I have in here today? Raise your hand if you're a mom. Raise your hand if you had a mom. How many times have mom looked across the room and just went, She didn't need to say anything, did she? How many times, if you're married, has your wife looked at you like that? Not my wife. I'm an angel at home. Not my wife. Diana can look at me across the room and just go. She said a whole bunch by not saying one word. A whole bunch. But this angel not saying one word through the posture and the place that he was setting tells us everything. It tells us everything. If I were to title my sermon today, I would entitle it this. As we replant God's church, you need to watch where you sit. I'm going to have you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning as we pray. Father, thank you for your presence. We thank you for your presence in this place. 
Father God, I'm thankful for those that chose to come with us today and those that are watching us online, Lord. I just, I'm thankful for their presence. Father God, I pray that we remove all distractions in our minds. And God, I pray that we open up our hearts for you to speak to us and encourage us. And God, I pray that we're bold enough to allow your word to convict us as we move closer to you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your almighty son's name and what he did for us. And everyone said, amen. So let me ask you a question to start off. How did you pick your seat today? Be nice. All right. How did you pick your seat today? Now, there's some people that'll come in and they'll just plop down wherever they can sit down. But there's some people that it's totally different. When you come in to sit down, you're strategic in where you sit. Amen? Right? Some people are really, really strategic. When I go anywhere with my family, now that we're like a family of 50 people, when I go anywhere with my family, where we sit in any auditorium in any place is strategic. Because I don't know when I'm going to have to yank one of the kids out of the room. I didn't say that, did I? No, I, yeah. Come on, come on, Abraham. Maybe you walked in the room and said, I don't want to sit too close to the preacher. I know the way that guy sweats. I don't want to get any shrapnel from him, so I'm going to sit back. Maybe you, some of you sit in the back of the sanctuary because you don't want to be called out. <laughs> Do you think that's really going to change this? Do you think I'm not going to call you out? Yes, I will. Don't think that is a good thing. But we're strategic when we come in and sit. Why? Because where we sit matters. Where we sit matters. And I'm not just talking about our bottoms anymore. I'm talking about this. And I'm asking you this question. Where does your soul sit? Where does your soul sit? The angel is presenting to us without a single word. The angel is presenting to us this idea that where you sit really matters. Where you sit really matters. It matters that you know that your soul is right with God. It matters that your soul and your mind and your emotions are right and your will is right with God. It matters where your soul sits. So as you start looking through Scripture and you start, you start going through and you start studying places in, in the Bible where people had sat down and, and you see that there's lots of cases of that. You, you see that and you, you see where Jesus sits down and you start to read some of that language and you see, you, you see in Scripture that God is seated on His throne in heaven and Jesus is seated beside Him. You see, you see all of these aspects and these perspectives and you begin to notice that, that not every time that someone sits down is significant, but, but a lot of times in Scripture you get told where somebody sits and that's symbolic and it means something. I'll give you an example out of 1 Kings 19, 3 and 4. It says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom brush set. Did I say broom brush? I did, didn't I? A broom bush. Yeah, I get all that water, don't I? He sat down under it and prayed that he might die. See the contrast there? It wasn't just Elijah physically setting down. His soul sat down there. His soul sat under that broom bush. So much so that he was suicidal. So it wasn't just where his bottom took a seat. It was his very being set down under that broom. Bu- <laughs> oh, well. Sorry, guys. I'm adjusted to, doing, adjusted to doing this twice in like two hours. I apologize, okay? But he sat down under this broom bush. 
And what's great about the Bible is when you start looking between the words and you start seeing what God's communicating to us and you start breaking that down word by word and looking at that, you see that the Bible it, it is so deep and so alive and so active in our everyday lives. And you can see that. Maybe you wonder what a broom bush is. There's a story in itself there. So the significance of the broom bush, bush <laughs> mm. the broom bush is also known as a juniper tree. And this bush was uh, very indigenous to the area, uh, a lot of the area that Scripture was written in. And I, I want to lay this foundation out and let you know that where you set matters. So it says Elijah went and sat under this broom bush. And there's a few interesting things about broom bushes I want you to see. Number one is this. A broom bush grows in a dry place, in a desert region. region. That speaks to us that sometimes, I don't know if you've ever been in a dry place in your life. And when we are, we need to watch where we sit. If you're ever sitting in a place where it's dry and weary and desertous, we need to check our souls to, to say, is this really sh where I should be sitting? Should I find something uh, or a place far more fruitful to set on? Because we shouldn't set in a dry place. The other thing interesting about a broom bush is that it produces a better root. Now, the root of a broom bush is edible. We see that in Scripture. We see that people actually ate of the broom bush. Job 33 and 4 says, they were gaunt with poverty and hunger. They claw the dry ground in the desolate wastelands. They pluck wild greens from among them, the bushes, and eat from the roots of broom trees. So none of y'all is going to go, man, I want some broom tree for lunch when I get out of here. No one's going to say that, okay? Think of a broom tree as pineapple on pizza. I had big support for the first service in this, I'm just saying. I had huge support, all right? No one ever wants to put pineapple on their pizza. They're just with those odd people that put pineapple on their pizza, so they eat it, right? No one ever eats refried beans on purpose. It's because nothing else is there, amen? I've lost everyone, Eric. They're gone. They're gone. But if we're not careful, church family, if we're not careful as individuals, if we're not careful as a church, as we are in the process of replanting and seeing what God's vision is for us as a church, if we're not careful and we allow ourselves to set in places we shouldn't set, then we'll start to be, begin to feed on the root of bitterness. We'll start to feed on the root of things that are not Christ-like. We'll start to feed on those roots because that's what's around us. If we're not careful, we got to watch where we sit. Final thing about a broom bush is the twigs were used for binding. They used the twigs to bind things up. Isn't it ironic, isn't it interesting and symbolic that Elijah was suicidal and he ran to this dry, desolate place and he sat down under a tree uh, with which bitter roots come from, and he was bound. He was bound. I don't know how many times I can re reiterate this morning that we have to watch where we sit. We truly do. Elijah ran to a place that he shouldn't have gone, to a source in which he shouldn't have partaken in, and he was bound by it. And we got to watch our souls and make sure our souls aren't sitting in places they shouldn't be. Now let's compare something, just something real subtle, okay? But it's significant. We talked about this, okay, before, but I'm going to talk about it again. It says, he came to a broom bush, sat down, and watch this. Elijah, it says in here, it says in the passage there, it says, that he sat under it and prayed he might die. Now, if you're so inclined, you can flip back to Matthew 28 in verse 2, and it says, There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back on the stone, and he what? 
sat on it. He didn't sit under it. He sat on it. He sat on it. That phrase there means uh, above, beyond. He sat on it. He could have just strolled up there like a boss, right? Could have just cross his legs and wait for, for waiting for him to show up and be like, how you done? Come on in. But he didn't. He made a statement. He made a statement. And the statement he was making is you can either sit under your circumstances or you can sit on them. But you can't do both. You can't do both. We got to make a decision that we can sit under our circumstances or we can sit on them by the power of Jesus Christ. We have to make this choice. So what is meant to bring defeat in our life becomes our seat. You guys with me? What the devil tried to, to stop, uh, the devil tried to stop, uh, the, the thing that the devil stopped, tried to stop Jesus with, became the very thing that the angel set on. Do you get that? The very thing that the devil put in there to keep Jesus from being resurrected from the dead was the very thing the angel set on. It's the very thing he set on. And just a side note for us this morning as we're worshiping and as we're learning in God's Word, where you choose to set doesn't just impact you. Please don't be so selfish to think that it's just about you. Where you choose to set impacts everybody around you. It, it impacts everyone around us. 2 Kings 10.30 says, And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in accomplishing what is right in my eyes, and you have done... Uh, to the house of Ahab, all I had in mind to do, watch this, your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Church family, my desire isn't that we just figure out how Christ wants us to do church. That is a huge, we need to do that. But we also need to position our church for generation after generation after generation after generation to come to the Lord. We need to put this church in a position where it is reaching out to the lost and people are being saved in the name of Jesus Christ and transformed in the name of Jesus Christ far beyond me and far beyond you. And in order to do that, we have to watch where we sit. We have to watch where we sit. We have one perfect example in Scripture, don't we? One perfect example we can always go back and reference. And I'm to the point now where I'm sweating enough where the earpiece is falling off. So if I'm grabbing my ear, I'm not having an earache or COVID symptoms. I'm simply trying to keep my mic on. Hebrews 12.2 says this. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on who, church family? Jesus, the pioneer and protector of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The right hand of the throne of God. Look where our Savior is setting. Look where he is setting. Where we set matters. I want you to understand something as well, too. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He knew he had to. He didn't want to go to the cross. He despised the cross. But he was able to enjoy, or endure the cross for the joy set before him. He was able to look past the cross at the joy that was on the other side of the cross. And, 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 and he had to make a choice where to set. He battled through this in the garden. We read that where he battles through it. Some people say the battle was won on Golgotha. I agree, but he made the decision and the choice in the garden. Amen? He said, I refuse to sit under this. I refuse to sit down. 
under this. I will be at the right hand of the throne of God. That is where our king is seated right now. And when you and I drive home from work, when you and I have decisions and choices we have to make every day, when you and I are going through the things we go through and battling the addictions we battle and all of those things, we have a choice to make. If you're a follower in Jesus Christ, you have already been victorious. You can sit on top of that because you're a child of God. Oh, oh, you don't understand, Pastor. My thing is this. My thing is that. Uh, I, you don't understand. I'm like Elijah. I'm sitting under this broom bush because I just simply can't handle this. I'm going to argue with you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, you have the option to sit on top of all those things. All of them. Any of you guys like to save seats for other people? Your mom, okay, you get a pass. It's your mom. All right, you get a pass. Moms get a pass. But besides that, I'm not saving a seat for you. I love you, but if you can't get there on time, (laughs) with the exception of mom, brother, you are right. I'm going with you. But do you guys remember going to a movie theater? Remember those days back in the day? I'm going to, you know, I feel like I'm going to have to tell my kids, there was these things called movie theaters. And you paid for movies, and you went in, they had giant screens. And you walked in, and you paid half your week's salary for some popcorn and a box of dots. <laughs> these places were special. Yeah. How many times I remember going to see Terminator 2, and it was a premiere night, and I had to save a seat for someone and almost got in a fight with someone because I needed to save a seat. I thought, I'm never saving a seat again. But you sit there in the theater, and somebody comes in, you say, seat's taken, seat's taken, can't sit here, can't sit here, seat is taken. Now, I'm no psychologist, but they have, we have, all have something that we call the seat of emotion. It's our seat of emotion. We actually have three different parts in our brain and, and that work all simultaneously. Now, the wives are looking at the husbands right now going, you don't have three parts to your brain, trust me. All right? But we have the survival brain, and if you're breathing, guess what? You're surviving. That part of the brain is functioning fine, Okay? Then we have the logical brain, and because this is all new, we're not even going to go into that, okay? Give me a couple months, and then we'll go into that. But we have the logical brain, and then we have uh, the third one is the emotional brain. That's the aspect of our brain that decides where your emotions are going to take a seat. That's the battle you have in your mind all the time. Am I the only one that battles things in my mind all the time? We all are battling things. That's the part of your brain that's battling those things. Do I, do I face this or do I sit quietly? Do I do this or do I do that? What do I do? Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by power and petition and thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Paul also tells us to keep our our, our every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ because you need to get a hold of the seat of your emotions. You need to get a hold of your thoughts. You need and I need to begin to discipline ourselves. So what happens when we do that and we take that thought and we make those captive to Christ and we start living in the victory that Christ has provided for us when we're sitting in an auditorium and somebody comes up in that seat, they want a seat in fear is what they are. You could say, no, no fear. This seat is taken. When, 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 uh, when anxiety creeps up in your life, you say, no, 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 no. You can't sit here. That seat is taken. When, when things happen in your life, you, you, you can simply say, you know what? I've reserved this seat for peace. I've reserved this seat for joy. I've reserved this seat to have victory in Jesus Christ because I am a child of his. We have to save those seats. 
Finally, this morning, I want you to understand that a seat has been saved for you. A seat has been saved for you. My wife got me the coolest birthday present several years ago. I mean, most awesome birthday present. She got me tickets for her and I, no kids. Oh, it's glorious. Just her and I. Her and I to go see Robert Cray. Now, all of you should know who Robert Cray is. What's that snark? He's only the best blues man ever to walk this earth. All right? He's only the best blues man to walk this earth. And I got, uh, she got me these seats and I was so excited. And it's blues music, guys. So blues music fills up an auditorium about this size. That's just the way blues music is now. It's not, it's not, you know, uh, they're not, it's not extremely popular unless you're over in Europe. If you're over in Europe, they're going to fill up 10,000 seat auditoriums. But in America, the blues is just, eh. But she gets me this seat. These, she gets us two seats, two tickets to this, and we get to go to this concert. And I'm so excited, and we're, we're driving up there. It's a Friday night concert. We're going to stay in Chicago till Saturday. And we get to the will call window to pick up our tickets. And I had even a cooler surprise that my wife had given me. When we got the tickets and placed them in my hand, I looked down and we were in the first row. Yeah. First row. First row, not even first row in the corner. No one puts the baby in the corner. Not, I'm just seeing, just seeing who's watching. I'm just asking. All right. But the first row smack dab in the middle to see a guy that I've been listening to for 25 years. It was so cool. It was so awesome. And the theater was just stunning. One of those old theaters with the balcony and all that. And I sat down and, you know, Jim Pugh on the keys is up there. And bass player, it just everyone's getting ready. And, you know, Robert Cray isn't out yet. And I'm like, ooh, yeah, it's on. Right? This is going to be great. And then it popped in my head, man, we got these great tickets. We got these great tickets. And then I looked back and I saw people sitting all the way in the back of the theater. All the way in the back. And I, and I thought just for a second, huh, stinks to be you. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I looked back there and I thought, man, I thought, what did we do to deserve to get to sit in the front row? That concert had sold out within like three days of it being announced. Then I got to thinking, boy, what did we do to deserve even to be able to come to this concert? What did I do to deserve this, God? This is incredible. You know, when it comes to a seat being saved for us in heaven with our Savior, Jesus Christ, There's nothing we can do to deserve that. There's nothing we do to deserve that seat. So if you're sitting here and you're going, you know what, Pastor, you're saying a seat has been reserved for for me. I get that. But you know what? I haven't paid for that seat. To be honest with you, Pastor, I can't even afford to sit in that seat. I'm here to tell you this morning, don't worry, because even... Because that seat's reserved for you, and there's no way you could afford it. No matter what amount of money you had or no matter what you've done. You can't afford that. Our sins, our shames, our mistakes, our mess-ups, all of those things that we do, the, the sin that we are born into us tells us that we can't pay for that seat. But Jesus pays for that seat. And the seat's reserved for you and I. And in order for this church to be planted the way this church needs to be planted, we need to be living in that truth. And we need to be seated next to Jesus in everything that we do. I'm going to have you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. No one looking, heads bowed and eyes closed. I want you to hear this truth that's promised to us as a follower of Jesus Christ. 
It says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ. We're going to be seated next to our Savior Jesus. We can declare victory in all that we do and all that we are because we are followers of Jesus Christ. As you're sitting in your seat today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, now's the time. Because it matters where you sit. If you're sitting here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, but maybe you've been a follower of Jesus Christ for years and years and years, but you never lived in the power that the Holy Spirit has given you, then this altar is available for you to change that today. Where you sit matters. As Pastor Eric and I will be forward today, if there's any decisions or prayer that you need, we're for you during this altar.